Uh, Sam, it's very good to see you uh, at these strange times. Um, and I know uh, Thoughts One Can't Do Without uh, With was written before everything that we are now dealing with uh, began, but there does seem to be a, an obvious relevance to it at the moment. I, I know it, uh, it gives me no pleasure, uh, although it does really, although I wouldn't really want it to be widely known, that the book seems more relevant now than when I wrote it. Let's talk about that simple preposition with, because what you're saying here focuses so much on that word and the importance of people being with one another. Uh, why that focus particularly? I think it, it's something that's, uh, as I talk about in the uh, concluding remarks, it's something that's that's grown on me as I've reflected on my own life, but also on my ministry as a as a as a priest and a pastor, uh, but also on the kind of initiatives I've been involved in in the secular world, in community development, and other such things. Um, it, but the most of all, the most significant thing about about with is is how we expect to spend eternity. If you, if you accept some, some version of the Christian notion of heaven, um, then you've, you've got to say, what would perfection look like? Uh, and it, it's become clear to me that all the things we scurry around spending our lives doing, fixing things, making the world a better place, won't be necessary. So what would happen to us all if there was no problems to fix? we would have to learn to be with one another. And that is apparently what all the fixing of problems is designed to make possible. And yet so many of us, even when presented with the opportunity, like on a, on a holiday just with somebody we love, still seem to find 15 different ways to avoid actually doing that. Fixing problems does, does come up in here a lot. Um, the idea that we are to a degree satisfied, perhaps too satisfied, if we have fixed something, because we feel we've achieved something, we have done something for somebody else. Um, but you want to go beyond the for and take us more to the with. I, I, again, I, I think if, if you think of the, the caricature picture of a parent with a child, the parent is busy either preparing supper or working from home during the pandemic. Um, and the child comes slightly tearful with a toy. Uh, so what is, what is that child really asking for? Um, the simplest way is to turn that into a transactional relationship in which uh, the parent is, uh, can fix the toy. And actually you can get tremendous satisfaction from, from fixing a toy. Uh, and the child looks at you in a way that they won't ever look at you in the rest of your life as a person of great genius and expertise. So there's tremendous satisfaction in that working for relationship. But what the child is really asking you is come and play with the toy with me. And, and the, the, the tendency of, you know, the great majority of people is to prefer the role of the toy fixer than the sharing, the sharing with her. Uh, and, and that just replicates in the way our whole society is constructed. Uh, so, for example, parents want their children to go to good schools so they'll get a good education, so they'll spend the rest of their life doing what? Uh, usually, if they're more concerned about the money, uh, getting into some kind of service where a stockbroker, for example, invests, uh, invests for a client, or if they're on more on the, <clears throat> the caring side, they, they become a dentist or something and fix people's teeth for them. Uh, but they both have that for nature. We become very competent at something. We spend the rest of our life doing it for people. Uh, the trouble is that that doesn't really deepen a relationship. Uh, and it's, it's in the depth of relationship that real joy is to be found. Most of these working for relationships sit, constantly defer the moment of actually being with, but surely being with is the reason why we, en we enter into these working for relationships. We're trying to, if you like, clear a swamp so we can build a house, so we can furnish that house, 
so that we can finally sit down. And what do we do in that house together? Presumably, we relate to one another. And yet we spend our whole lives clearing the swamp, building the house and going out and buying the furniture. There's never time to sit down and actually reap the rewards. You used an interesting word in there about deferring um, being with. So we're, we're kind of what, deliberately avoiding it, putting it off because it's more difficult? Well, again, at the end of the book, I, I use an example from my own life, uh, which I think is, has taught me more than any other single thing in my life. Uh, when I was a teenager, my mother told me she was going to die. She, I expected it to be quick, but it took three years. And then for the next three years, I pretty much every day had the choice between whether I was going to sit by her bedside as she was confined to her bedroom, certainly for the last nine months and, and for quite a bit of the time beforehand, or I was going to be you know, super sun and cook meals and wash clothes and generally be busy around the house. And, you know, my regret in life uh, is that I spent so much time being super sun and not enough time sitting by her bedside, which is what she really wanted and needed because these wonderful meals I was learning to cook, she wasn't going to eat. You know, the, the, the process of bringing her, her lunch or her supper upstairs was just a gesture to say, I'm thinking of you but she wasn't capable, you know, she was getting thinner and thinner. She wasn't capable of eating that food. So that became a sort of parable of my life and ministry in which I constantly saw how much easier it is in the face of anxiety to try and do things for people than it was simply to sit with the powerlessness uh, of being with them. Because you point as well to an incident when you were first ordained, um, a gas explosion. Yes, and that 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 was a that was in a sense had the same effect on my ministry as the experience with my mother had on my life. I, I was. It's what happens to every curate. They're first ordained. Three weeks after they're ordained, the vicar, uh, you know, heaves a sigh of relief, goes off on holiday. So all this happened. I think the day after my my boss went on holiday. There was a big gas explosion. Two or three members of the congregation, along with a number of other people, ended up in hospital uh, with very significant facial and other burns. Uh, and, you know, the community felt powerless. They also felt, felt guilty because there'd been a bit of a falling out with that couple uh, just a few months before. So the combination of the powerlessness and the guilt meant the community swung into action doing things like tidying out the garage and, and tidying up the house of this couple. Well, actually, the couple were quite happy with an untidy house. They didn't actually like people meddling around in their garage, which of us really would. And uh, but so in, in their desperate effort to work for, to do something, um, they actually further antagonised this couple, whereas all that was really required was to sit by their bedside, hold their hand and look into their face, even though both of the couple knew that their face wasn't great to look at. Um, and that was the hardest thing to do. Uh, I think I, it was before I had a car, so this is really going back to the dark ages. Uh, I used to get the bus across, all the way across town pretty much every weekday to, to go and see them. I'm not the clear out the garage type really. Um, which you'd know if you saw my garage, but but uh, but in the end, uh, what that taught me was just how how in our anxiety we we revert to four as the default, uh, even even when it's clearly not working, you know, when people don't want it, um, because we just can't cope with the the, the powerlessness of with. Um, the word with takes me to the very beginning of the book when you talk about the paradoxes of our age and you talk about loneliness and isolation um, and there's quite a lot of reflection here on the way the modern world is affecting those concepts uh, a world where we are in theory as you and i are now able to communicate by all manner of digital means but that doesn't necessarily mean that you and i are with one another at this moment uh, well, what it means is that one of the paradoxes I highlight at the beginning is is that we, you know you could be in Australia, I I, I could be um, in Hawaii or somewhere. We could be talking to each other. And that that is that is a blessing. Don't get me wrong. That's a blessing. However, especially at the moment, at the beginning, yeah, yeah. It um, it means that 
that James and Eileen next door to where I'm sitting, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily need need or want to get to know them. And actually, that has been one of the things many people have commented on during the pandemic, particularly the early stages of the uh, pot banging on Thursday nights for um, for for the NHS, is that people did actually get to know and rely on their neighbours when when people were getting a food delivery. It was very difficult to get on the roster for a Tesco food delivery or something like that back in May June people would knock on the neighbor's doors and say, we're running short of milk. Could you stick it on the end of your order? Uh, and, and so they built a kind of relationship, which if they'd spent their whole time just doing what we're doing, which many, many people have done during, during the pandemic because their work has been at home and so on, uh, you would never do. But, this, but the, <laughs> this kind of relationship brings many blessings, but it doesn't give milk. So, you know, the, 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 the necessities of life kicked in at the beginning of the pandemic and people were forced to rel relate to their neighbours whether they liked it or not. Uh, and actually, I think that was a good thing. Obviously, the pandemic's not a good thing. But the, the, so the paradox that I'm pointing to is that you can be very, very familiar. In fact, talk every day like this to a person on the other side of the world, but not even know the name of, the, of your next door neighbour. I mean, staying with social media for a moment, because there was... There were a couple of quotes in there which uh, stood out for me. With social media and its related technologies, we know more, but we understand less. Um, what are you driving at there? Well, um, I, I guess I, I use this word elsewhere about the phone. So I've got my phone uh, hmm. sitting, sitting next to me. I think you know what these things look like. <laughs> um, and to me, this is the great symbol of elsewhere. Yeah. Because... Yeah. Uh, when I'm talking to you, even like this, if I drift across to the phone, it's basically saying there's something more interesting than Julian in my life. If it buzzes, it's because I can't resist the idea that, you know, my, the invitation to take over from President Trump has finally come. And the American nation will change its constitution. That the fact that I wasn't born in America won't matter. And they'll finally recognize that I'm the only person to lead them. Um, there's always a possibility that that text will come and so every time a text comes I think that might be the text. If I hold pick up my phone when it's not uh, buzzing that's because being with you is either dull or my 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 hope that elsewhere that there might have been a text that didn't buzz and and people the, you know the American people might still need me mm. they, they just didn't buzz very loudly that that constant sense that that, that, that there's an escape from this current reality, whether it's unpleasant or just mundane or just been going on a bit too long or, and too familiar. Um, so that's what I call elsewhere. And, and obviously it breaks the first principle of, of being with, which I call presence. I'm just, I'm not able to be here. And, and social media offers you a constant array of ways to just glimpse another reality. Uh, most obviously the reality of your friends or acquaintances lives you know a glimpse into that why why when you take a photograph of Victoria Falls do, do all your friends need to know that you're there you're, you're you're somehow constantly persuading them that you have a more exciting you're a sufficiently exciting person for them still to be friends with I think that's you know, I suppose the sinister part of of that, you know, the dating world of, of today is that th there's an element to it that didn't used to be there. I'm not one of great nostalgia for how romance used to be in the 50s or something, but there was a pretty reasonable chance of what you see is what you get. Um, you know, you quite possibly grown up in the same community, maybe you're at the same university, these kind of things, quite, quite predictable range of interactions that doesn't mean that you don't marry the person they don't turn out to be to have characteristics you could never have guessed but let's let's take a normal situation whereas now it's perfectly normal for someone not to disclose some very significant pieces of information you know like whether they currently have a partner to somebody on a on a kind of a date uh, and that is um again that 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 just it, it increases the range of people we might meet. You know, dating apps are all about the idea that there's the perfect fit out there. We just have to search enough of them and we'll find that person. Um, it increases that range, but actually it, it, it decreases our trust that when we do meet that person, we're actually meeting that real person. You know, that they hadn't doctored the photograph or, or uh, 
uh, or, or um, and, and there's all sorts of vocabulary now for uh, for for the technique of presenting yourself in a in a false way. You know, it's we've created a whole vocabulary around that kind of thing, mm. uh, and so it's in other words, it's become perfectly normal. You move on in the book to methods of engagement and pose the question right at the start of that section, how is isolation to be overcome? And this takes us into these four methods, mm -hmm. working for, working with, being for, being with. Um, break those down a little Yeah, bit. I think of them as four windows. For those from a, a, an English or oh, UK background, play school used to have a sort of square window that is deep in our consciousness, I think. Um, so it's a it's a square lattice. So so working for is where I have all the assets and you have all the deficits. You're a basket case. I've got the answers. Maybe I'm a I'm a doctor. Maybe I'm a dentist. Maybe I'm a lawyer. And and my job is to bring all my expertise to bear on your difficult situation, which may be a a wisdom tooth or something, uh, or it may be a psychological breakdown or or anything in between. Um, but the resources are all on my side. And so the whole relationship is defined by affirming my assets and expertise and skills and recognizing that, that you're really a problem to yourself and others. Um, I've, 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 you know, I've caricatured it, but that is the principal way of professional interaction in our culture. It's what people go to university and do a master's and then maybe a further professional qualification to become highly competent and well paid at doing. So, you know, don't get me wrong, it's a, it's a big feature of our culture. Working with is a modified version of that when, when there's a realization that, that if there is a problem, it takes a whole village, if you like, to, mm. to address it. So there's so, collaboration in that one. Exactly, classically with a homeless problem or something like that in the center of a city, you'd bring business leaders, you'd bring the local council, voluntary groups, faith groups, and homeless people themselves around the table and they'd all talk about what to do. Um, being with is the third one, and being with is is where you move away from the notion of problem and solution. You don't see the whole world as configured by problems that you have to solve. Uh, you you relate, you seek all opportunities to create relationship. And being for is the one that I find most problematic, really, and I think has grown particularly in the internet era with blog sites and so on. Being for is where you spend your life basically telling everybody else how they should be fixing the world or how they're wrong about the, the language they use about race or about disability or about um, homelessness or whatever it is. You're constantly refining the best way to see the world, but you're not actually acting in it. So the thing about the two for ones, working for and being for, is you never actually have to meet the needy person at all. You can, you can, because you already know all the right things about their life. Um, whereas the two with ones, working with and being with, are about relationship. They're slightly different. The working with still is captivated by the problem solution uh, axis. Being with is trying to break away from that. So being with is what is what the um, what the book is about. Uh, but I take working with very seriously in many cases, working with is a, is a wonderful example of how to relate. Uh, and going back to something we mentioned a moment ago, does that mean that the people who are in the being for and working for category are the ones who may be doing a, a huge amount of work uh, and deriving great satisfaction from that work, but in some cases might be doing it in part to avoid addressing the two well weeks. that's the um, challenge that's the challenge i'm making really and and they're they're different uh challenges so working for um you know the, the i don't get me wrong i still want to have my dentist i value her very much <laughs> she does things i can't do and don't want to do and need doing however even in the most working for s scenario um let's take the dentist hmm. she's constantly telling me to floss more uh, that's what dentists kind of say and and but that's trying to turn a working for relationship into a working with relationship again the best relationship you have with your solicitor is where your solicitor is is coaxing out of you information that the barrister will turn into an argument and and 
that then so even the, the lawyer relationship actually can become a, a working with relationship and obviously the doctor says if you weren't smoking so much we wouldn't be having this conversation so that's a you know that's a uh, that's a working with so so the best working for relationships become a working with even a local MP who speaks on your behalf in Parliament has had a surgery where they've come to know your local issues. Uh, the being for thing is is to me is is a is, is a retreat from from the the hurly burly of of, of regular life. It, it, you can't actually solve the world's problems from behind a computer screen, as many people are finding uh, during the pandemic. You know, you can just shift the uh, deck chairs around the Titanic. Uh, but from behind a computer screen, you can feel very effective and write your memos and so on. But 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 actually, the world changes through through transformed relationships, which you know, which aren't entirely possible online. So being for, I think, is is a um, is a, a not fully formed way of of relating. I know that sounds judgmental, um, but I remember going to a school not long ago where a pupil was being celebrated with the fact she developed this blog site and you know was getting some recognition for it um and i you know i challenge i challenged the school on it i'm, I'm you know you, you, that's not what the visitors should do they should just affirm the wonderfulness of every pupil but i i said well there's you know there's two kind of blog sites there's blog sites that can stir people to to action and relationship and there's blog sites that encourage people to sit back and comment and you know when you i i probably too much do too much of this i uh, i i read the comments on the commentary of the of football games and things like that and they're all telling the manager how they should better organize the team and, mm -hmm. and and the person is a loyal fan and knows all the names of the players who played for the team in the 70s and so on but actually they're not contributing in any material way to the team playing any better they're just sounding off mm -hmm. and that's if, what if, you, if they feel about. momentarily better about that and it makes them feel better and, and fine if if in a, in a scenario where you know they're they're fully engaged in a working with type scenario in their regular life and this is just letting off steam in the evening with, with a bunch of mates then it's really pretty much harmless i'd say but if that's your major form of life uh then i think there's a there's a problem there and and you know so one of the great things about community organizing which is a classic working with phenomenon is it takes people from being for to working with uh, and 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 that is fantastic to see when people actually see the, the the power that can be generated in common action through through relationship. My only worry about community organising is it tends to instrumentalise relationship, um, which is a, is a major problem. But uh, but it's a way better than being four in almost every case. We then move on to the eight dimensions of being with, which begins with presence and makes it way, its way through uh, attention, uh, participation. Um, and I loved that there was an element of participation which particularly struck me. You, you talked about the grandparent-grandchild relationship at one point mm -hmm. and how that, how that by its very nature of the age of the two participants um, it naturally evolves, uh, and I thought that so was interesting. Observation. I got this idea from a uh, a book by Tommy D. Paola. I think he just died, but he he write he used to write children's books, and my favourite of his children's books is called Now One Foot Now the Other, and it starts with uh, a little boy uh, and his granddad, uh, and the granddad is is teaching the little boy to walk, uh, and then. I won't tell the whole story, but eventually the, the, the roles change and the granddad has a stroke and the little boy, uh, it, it, the last scene of the book is where the little boy is helping the granddad to walk. And it's just a reverse, it's a, just a perfectly satisfying, it's the most satisfying children's book I've ever read, where the, where the boot, you know, the boot's on the other foot and you realise that each each person is bringing their different qualities. So it's a, it's a perfect description of partnership where I bring you know, my, my skills and needs to the relationship and you do the same. And those change over time in ways that are beneficial to both of us, but the relationship is just as strong. So that came under participation. You then moved to delight, 
the perception of abundance where another might only see scarcity. Uh, so, de yeah, delight is 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 really about what um, people like John McKnight call uh, asset based development. So that's where I see I see the person not I, I don't see the the 20 things that, um, you know, public life would condemn about a person's life and put them in prison for. I see only the sparkle in their eye that 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 is that is something beautiful that that could could uh, benefit themselves and other and in, in others in the future and and obviously having done a lot of work with homelessness over the last few years that's a classic case where a person can you know they could have been on mastermind on on tv they could have um they could be a fantastic cook they they could be uh, very handsome um but we we call them homeless and that is the one thing we define them by the one thing they don't have a home whereas they may have looks intelligence uh, skills and we ignore those things so delight is constantly seeing uh, the joy in the other not the deficit uh, but different from enjoyment which comes a page or two later on so enjoyment rests on this definition that uh, Augustine uses, uh, you know, the, the fourth century theologian between what we use and what we enjoy. What we use is a, is a means to an end. What we enjoy uh, takes, you know, is an end in itself. It takes the whole of us. And so I use this illustration actually from my own experience walking in the Alps a few years ago when I saw, you know, I was probably at about... Um, 11,000 feet and saw an ibex uh, and you know I, I'd seen them in pictures and I'd seen them from a very long way away before but I hadn't seen them from like 150 yards and I I could have just taken a photograph which would be using in a way it would be something to put in an album send to a friend um, but actually what I did is I put the camera down, I put my bag down and I crept and the whole process took about half an hour, just step by step, closer and closer and closer until I was about as close as I dared to be. And then stayed in that place for quite some time, just adoring, really, just admiring and taking in the wonder of this animal with these huge, great horns reaching out behind its neck uh, and just, uh, you know, feeling in awe of of creation of another of another being and so you know that 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 was one of my most profound experiences of enjoying it took every ounce of my strength and um energy and you know i've been walking for five hours already by that point so i i had to sort of sacrifice my sense of getting to the top of the mountain and having a picnic and you know and, and take a lot of time out of the day but I've got no regrets. It was just a most wonderful experience. And that's that's to enjoy. And, and I guess what I'm, uh, you know, what the, the almost the kind of conclusion of the book is to say it's that kind of enjoyment that is the peak human experience. And and all our efforts should be not only to to get to that point for ourselves, but to communicate that enjoyment in all our relationships. And this, this phrase that I use about uh, my congregation members, I don't expect them to articulate it in this language. Of course, they will know they can read this book. But, but to say what, what I want people to think as, as part of the congregation is to say everywhere else in my life I'm used. You know, I'm the checkout assistant and people just want to get through me as quickly as possible. Or I'm the lawyer and people just want to have the case settled as quickly as possible. But here I'm enjoyed. In this community, I'm truly enjoyed. People appreciate the full wonder of me. They're present to me. They attend to me. They see the mystery of me. They delight in me. They want to do things with me and participate with me. It's a partnership where they see my skills and their skills all working together. So all of that together makes enjoyment. So enjoyment, in a sense, is the, the epitome of a being with experience. Uh, because it's almost the last dimension, but the very last dimension. It's the one that is the perfect seven. And I, I, but I finish that that sequence of uh, of dimensions of being with with glory because uh, I guess enjoyment is 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 something that that you and I share. I enjoy you. I fully appreciate the wonder of who you are. Glory is putting that in a transcendent frame of reference where I see that as actually the more I enjoy you, the more I worship the the you know 
God, as Christians put it, the, the, the power in the universe that makes it possible for such things to be. So it's, a, it's not in a, that sense um, narcissistic. It's not, it's not just self-contained uh, about our relationship. It's, it's, it's in a cosmic dimension. You talked about your congregation and how obviously you would hope that they will read this book. Um, when they do uh, and they contemplate what you're saying in it and take a look at themselves in the mirror, what, what do you want them to to debate with themselves about the way they lead their lives? Yeah, I, I want them to to uh, do what I've done as I've articulated these thoughts over the last few years, really, which is to take um, account of uh, all their relationships and 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 work out to what extent they use and to what extent they enjoy, to what extent their four relationships are, um, a, a, you know, early steps on a journey to what should be with. So to give an example from the life of St. Martin's, our Sunday International group is, uh, you know, works with asylum seekers. And I just use that phrase casually, works with. I mean, it. it you know this the 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 conventional instinctive uh way that amateurs shall we say approach a problem like asylum seeking is to think they need two things they need a sandwich and they need a bed um and so there's lots of ministries around the providing those two things but in practice those aren't actually the th things that asylum seekers most need they need companionship they need human interaction you know, these are often very talented people who've, you know, left Senegal because they're gay or come, you know, fallen out with a, a, a clan in, in Bengal and, and had to leave India or, it, it, you know, there's a, there's a story behind why they're there, but they're perfectly talented people. Um, and, and they need to make relationships because we all do. Otherwise, you know, you can't live, live in London uh, often with no fixed abode to you know and and not not need to talk not need to share so so i think a lot of people originally volunteer from the congregation side to be part of the, the because the, of the sunday international because they think like most people think that people need food uh, and they need showers uh, you know and we provide things like that but what they really need is relationship so I'd, I'd like that to be a kind of a model and i think it is a model of how you start in a working for mindset where you think the other person's got nothing and you, you've got guilt because you have some privilege, you have some, have some access to food. And then gradually that morphs into something where it becomes a working with relationship where some of the asylum seekers become volunteers themselves and they provide the food and so on. And that's the working with thing. And then the thing beyond that is where you, you just enjoy talking with them, whether there's any food or showers or washing machines or any of that, that's just an excuse to create relationship. And those are, and that, you know, that has happened. And that's the most wonderful thing about that group. Those people in your congregation who, who read this and, and digest it along the lines you've just described, they are, I'm assuming, by dint of the fact that they're coming to your church practicing Christians. Um, if somebody were to read this who has no faith, what would they, do you suggest, take out of it? So this book, I mean, the, the history of this book, which I tell a bit in the notes at the end, I wrote a book called A Nazareth Manifesto in 2015, which was which was exactly what I said on the tin. It was a manifesto. It was a it was a, a addressed you know, really to the theological community to to realign uh, not just the life of the church, but also the major theological themes, most obviously jesus and the cross which is the classic usually presented as the classic working for thing he died for our sins kind of thing and i rework that in this with frame of mind so that so i i i gave that to a, a prominent person he's a bit older now so not as visible in public life but a, a fairly you know somebody who was pretty visible in public life 15 20 years ago and he said i love the book but you've got to rewrite it for a secular audience so when I met Octavia, the, the editor of this, um, and she started talking to me about doing a book like this, I thought, ah, this is my opportunity to do exactly that. And while she was quite happy for me to keep some theological elements in there so people could see where the sources of these thoughts were, it's basically a book written for a secular audience. And I, uh, I do think um, 
that these basic ideas, you know, moving from working for to being with in the simplest possible way, are things that have resonance for for anybody, regardless of whether they're coming from a faith background or not. Uh, particularly is that, you know, that story I tell at the end, it's not designed to be emotional, but I think everybody can understand it. That picture of me as a 15 year old trying to work out whether to sit in my mum's bedroom as she was dying or cook her meals and wash clothes and, and all the other things she taught me to do. I think everybody can understand that, that paradox and then look at their life in, as they sit with somebody else who's suffering and recognize that tremendous impulse to pile in and fix it for the person. Mm -hmm. So let's just say right now, I'm, I'm sharing with you that, um, uh, that a mutual friend is, is self-harming. Let's just imagine a scenario like that. And, and this has just come to light. You know, I would say the majority of people would pile into that situation, say, have you been to see your GP? This could be something for a psychiatrist. I wonder what's in your personal history, maybe that you haven't had a chance to share. You know, all these ways to say, I know better than you do what's going on in your life. And I only heard about it 30 seconds ago, but I'm already piling in with all these answers to fix your problem. Whereas I would like people to aspire to be the only person in that person's life who isn't trying to fix them as a problem, but is happy just to get, is basically saying, I'll go on being your friend, whether you go on self-harming for the rest of your life, and even if it gets more serious. And, you know, there are so many people, for example, who experience things like ME, where they're more or less housebound in the midst of life, and they're surround, all their friends turn into these quasi-professionals saying, I saw a video about how someone got over this. And they suddenly all their friendships become a problem to them because they can't resist sending them these little YouTube videos of how to fix your life problem in three easy steps. And so with friends like that, I'm constantly trying to be the one person who never, ever does that. You can trust me. I am never going to send you a video. I'm never going to send you a little article from a condensed medical journal that's, that, that solves all of this. I, you're, you're a grown up. You're perfectly capable of, of accessing that kind of thing yourself. I want our relationship to go on being one where we simply enjoy each other and I don't start seeing you as a problem. So I think that that, that all of that applies to anybody. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's interesting because, I mean, uh, talking about the secular audience idea, I mean, I came to it reading it from a non-faith background and I, I got to the end of it thinking, and uh, this, this will sound glib, but it's not supposed to sound glib. I'm surprised you didn't mention God more often than you did. Well, um, I, I have other books where I, I do that. This, this was uh, this was uh, this is hopefully a taster for people to think if they enjoy reading this, and might want to read some of those other things. But um, as as I said, you know, the the it starts from to use a technical term, a, an eschatological background. That's to say, what will life be like after we die? Um, and if you know, if if you believe in some kind of life beyond then then it has to be a being with life it seems so that so the compelling argument is really if that's how we're going to live forever why don't we start practicing that and it could apply and this appears right at the end of the book you argue um to for example how welfare provision is organized if you were to go to sort of knock on the doors of, of power yeah. in the country now and say look apply this thinking to the way you help those who are most in need in this country. definitely well that and, that's, and one so welcome uh, yeah with, well with a couple of colleagues i wrote a book called for good uh and published in 2017 on the 75th anniversary of the publication of the beverage report because what the beverage report which as many people know created the welfare state did is it identified the five great evils uh of want and disease and ignorance and so on but in the perspective that i'm offering that's a deficit model where you're you only seeing what what negatives you want to eradicate and uh, what i'd like to, what i do propose in that book is is an asset model where where you think relationship uh um and creativity you know these these are the kind of things you want to cultivate in a good community and the argument of the book is that uh voluntary organizations you know obviously faith groups are prominent in my mind should spend their time on cultivating the assets because that's what they're strong on and leave the state to to deal with the deficits and i th i think that's you know that that's a direct application for how this could could transform what we're trying to achieve in welfare 
because the danger of welfare, is, as everybody knows, but few people want to say, is that it often keeps people in poverty rather than helping them get out of poverty. And if cultivating the assets is the only way to get out of poverty, as far as I'm concerned. I sense from, from reading this and also from the conversation that we've had that these thoughts are still sort of, there's still more room here for exploration. Well, this is an embarrassing thing. So I've written seven books about the word with. Um, this is the shortest. They're getting shorter. Um, <laughs> This is the short, I'm, I'm not exhausted it. I, I think, um, you know, obviously with all due modesty, I do think this is a, this is a contribution to um, how we think as a society about some of our most important things. I do think that sense that we're dom captivated, dominated by four, and that we neglect with to our own impoverishment is a, is a significant thing to say. And I never cease to find new context in which I feel the need to say it. So, and I, and I just on a friendship level, the number of people that I've introduced these ideas to who say, thank you, you know, this has changed my, you know, partnership with my partner, or this, this has changed the way I approach leading my organization, or this is the way I, I you know, changed the way my family spends its holidays, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, I, there's no way, you know, my email, inbox has got a lot of messages saying things like that so as long as it goes on being helpful to people i'll go on writing about it good we look forward to the next one um sam thank you so much